The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Mike, good afternoon. It's seven minutes past one on Manx Radio. Man in line on between now and one. Open line, you can text 166167. WhatsApp, same number, but you'll need to put 07624 in front of it and make sure we're in your contacts. Email studio at manxradio.com or call 66 13 68. I don't know whether you were listening yesterday when David Ashford, MHK, a prominent backbencher and, of course, a three-time minister, was talking about um, what he saw as uh, the, the um, well, crisis, really, state of our reserves, not immediately, but in the long term, if the spending plans go ahead the way that they are, and more importantly, the income uh, comes in as it is, um, we, uh, he thinks, are heading for trouble. Now, bearing in mind that most things that people ask of government will be solved by more money, more money for this, more money for that. Uh, everyone wants more money. How on earth do we get out of this position? What, uh, if you've got any thoughts, by the way, it's a bit late now because there are no by-elections, so you can't stand. But um, if you can get us out of this mess, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, mounting political and public divide over Kroger. Uh, Kroger drilling for gas off the coast of the Isle of Man. The energy firm recently announced it was handing money back to investors after talks failed to materialise with the government over drilling regulations. We've now come to this. You heard David Ashford criticise Uh, the Department of Infrastructure yesterday after revealing the government has known that the right drilling regulations haven't been in place for six years. Chris Thomas, MHK, was on The Breakfast Show this morning on Manx Radio and says the rules aren't needed for another 30 months. Well, the drilling regulations are to be developed when the drilling is to take place and the drilling was agreed with Kroger as recently as April 2022 to take place from January 2026. Basically, there are three types of regulations. The first type is the ones that exist. They're fully capable of being used for exploration. So, for instance, last winter, Kroger had a seismic survey permit from the Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture, which it didn't take advantage of and it's been in correspondence with them. So there are many regulations that already exist to cover the exploration phase. There are then the regulations like drilling regulations which Kroger knows all about. We've communicated greatly over the last months if not years with Kroger about this and those drilling regulations will look very similar to the ones from the UK and then there's a third type of regulations the ones which are are in the gap which we exist in the UK but don't exist in the Isle of Man and so therefore they're the difficult ones to to imagine they're all about what happens in the worst case and they're the hardest ones so we have actually worked with attorneys general's chambers to understand the gaps that we need to address and we've actually some months ago quite a few months ago now looked to begin to get all the money that would be involved in putting together those regulations because there's this oft quoted um, argument that um, this costs the public purse nothing it does cost the public purse money once you get into drafting regulations for this once in a lifetime opportunity which is the potential for hydrocarbons the situation is completely clear at the moment a seismic survey is needed and what Kroger has done is they've applied to vary their license previously they've varied their license I I now have expect to have all the paperwork very very shortly to be able to make an informed decision whether to allow Kroger to vary the license but they know exactly where they are because they've had a license since 2017 2018 the situation is clear it's just they want to change the situation Chris Thomas so where do we go from here exactly what on earth happens now and uh, you have Kroger on one side you have the department on the other side you have 
a, a mineral deposit of whichever size. We don't know whether it's exploitable, whether or not the untold millions that the Isle of Man Exchequer is promised uh, will materialise. But obviously there are people who put their hard-earned money, or did put their hard-earned money, into Kroger, although it's been returned, perhaps temporarily. We don't know. What happens? So... Should there be face-to-face -face discussions? The infrastructure minister insists his department has had huge communication with Kroger over the drilling regulations, despite the energy firm handing money back to investors, saying that talks had failed to take place. Chris Thomas, MHK, Minister for Infrastructure, thinks face-to-face -face discussions, getting together to talk, isn't always the right thing to do. I've met Kroger. I've also met with the potential well operator. I've also met with the potential environmental impact assessment. Sometimes what's even happened in those meetings has been misinterpreted or misrepresented. And the only reason why we need to avoid face-to-face -face meetings in that sense is if there's any risk to misrepresentation or inside what happens in those meetings. So I'm looking forward now to complete constructive dialogue with Kroger and its representatives to make sure that we can make the right decision for the people of the Isle of Man who, who have these hydrocarbons ultimately. It's a very important opportunity. So if you put together what David Ashford was saying about our reserves and the way that uh, we're leading in terms of you know, our fiscal position and the fact that there is a possibility that there may be hydrocarbons there, there's a possibility that Kroger may get them and the um, mechanism by which they're landed in the UK will bring us some money into our treasury, into our exchequer. Where does it leave us? Not only that, but put again, that against the backdrop of uh, exploiting hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbons, exploration and what have you, is uh, in some parts of the political sphere anathema. It's not something we should be doing in terms of our green future. Although Kroger have said that they've spoken to the biosphere people and that it won't actually harm our biosphere status. Text, email, call and WhatsApp uh, and lots of things uh, were talked about yesterday, including uh, there was, uh, I think it was Steve called in and said we should be using um, the site of Summerland to put in an indoor karting centre as well. Uh, and the fact that we don't have much like that on the Isle of Man is, uh, is a downward step. We used to have facilities for people to enjoy themselves, lots of facilities for people to enjoy themselves, and we don't have many of them anymore. Uh, Frank dropped a note in just to say, why should Douglas always benefit from developments? Douglas is a dump. Instead, why not love the things like this and stick them outside of Douglas to peel? Use the old Barford's factory and turn that into something for everybody. Indoor karting, trampoline centre, if I haven't seen. Put another bowling alley there. Just the bowling alley seems to be thriving in Ramsey. There used to be, do you remember, one on top of the other at the old Castle Mona. There were two bowling alleys, uh, bowling lanes there. So... How do we make sure we do that and square our financial position? Now, part of this is bringing industry into the Isle of Man, bringing businesses, people who want to actually come here to start companies, to employ people and to pay tax, to pay ITIP and national insurance. Um, it doesn't really help when the airport isn't in the best state and maybe somebody who's coming to bring a business here may be sitting on the ground at Gatwick. So you kind of see where we are. Now, I'm not saying this is just the Isle of Man's problem. The Western world has this problem. Uh, COVID was a, a battleground where uh, sort of national finances are concerned right across the Western world and, and beyond. So we're not alone. But how do we get out of it? Dodsey's got the answer. Hi, Dodsey. Oh, I wish I did have the answer. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this job. But I love my job. You know, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah... With regards to the entertainment, I mean, when when I was younger, yes, we had the summer land, and yeah, the uh, when the the Villa Marina was being rebuilt, they always said that that would be the then or now entertainment hub of the island, didn't they? It was supposed to be, wasn't it? Yeah, but I mean, I've tried taking my kids down to the uh, the Dragon's Castle on the weekends, and they say, oh, it's only for. Um, for birthdays and private parties on the weekends. That's no good to uh, 
to younger kids, is it? So, uh, but I mean, we used to have many more places, as you say, Summerland was there and uh, it got knocked down, but all the facilities inside, and there were some big facilities inside, lots of space. So it, it's just not oh, yeah. been replicated elsewhere. And when you knock these things off one by one at the time, you don't really notice it. But look back and say, we've lost a lot of facilities. Yeah, we have. I mean, we even lost, um, they had the Crescent, didn't they, where they had the arcades? I mean, when was the last time you saw an arcade on the island? I mean, they had the Lucky Star in Ramsey, don't get me wrong, but I mean... Yeah, uh, yeah and there was, one on Strand, there was one on Strand Street in Douglas, wasn't there? there we don't have any, we don't have any um, amusement arcades, any one-armed bandit um, arcades anymore. No, but I mean, the one on Douglas, uh, on, on uh, Strand Street, that was years ago. I mean, I remember going to that, like, when I was... Well, I'd say twelve, thirteen, but you know, it's one of those where there are adolescent kids that we need to have uh, somewhere to go and spend the money, and not just irritate and the other folks. Hmm. Well, we've got so, everybody yeah, we always have, says we everybody says now. we've got lots of beaches and we've got lots of glens and you can go walking to your heart's content and if you want to go mountain biking it's really second to none. But that's not for everybody. No, it isn't now and I can technically guarantee you that there's a lot of teenage kids that don't want to go hang around on it just because I mean look at Douglas Beach for example, yeah, they're trying to get um, everyone down there on Saturday for this beach thing, but that's not going to do them any favours. OK. All right, Dodgy, thanks for calling today. It's good to hear from you. And uh, just uh, prompts me to remind you that it is Douglas Beach Day this coming Saturday. Hopefully, if you can find somewhere to park, but I'm sure the weather looks uh, fairly favourable, so we hope it goes well. Julian's on now. Hi, Julian. Hi, Andy. Um, yeah, uh, just uh, listening about the Kroger thing, I think, to be honest, meetings are always best conducted in person. Um, you know, passing bits of paper around and doing Zoom calls even. I just, uh, I, think, <laughs> I think it's much better if everyone gets in a room and has a proper chat about it. What do you think Mr Thomas meant, that it's open to misinterpretation? Yeah, I don't understand. I mean, if you're in the room, you can flesh things out, especially, you know, you can achieve more in an hour in person than hours and hours of passing bits of paper around and things. I mean, but I mean, just... if you have two sets, two parties in a room, people can always take notes and you just send a, a confirmatory note at the end of it to say just confirming what we talked about. I mean, I understand it's a variation of the license. Well, it's Yes, because if you want to drill, you have to get a variation in the licence. So it's not something that was unexpected, is it? Well, the trouble is that um, we, we we get forms of words from both sides at the moment, and the you know the general public you know isn't au fait with two D and three D surveys and this that and the other. We just know that it costs a lot of money. We're bit, being told by one side that the gas is there and it's going to be a financial bonanza for the Isle of Man. We're told by another side. We're told by uh, you know net zero people and the green lobby that we shouldn't be doing it. And the government's in the middle, and they hold the license. It's the DOI that holds the license. Mm. But what does uh, the green lobby say? Of with net zero about China, India and Pakistan putting out far more in terms of massive amounts of increases in uh, coal power stations and gas power stations. Well, I don't want to speak on behalf of the Green Lobby, but I'll, I'll paraphrase, and I think their word is, their opinion is, we should be doing what we can do and we can't influence other people. So we, we, sh we should be setting a good example. Mm. Well, the good example that they're citing is wind turbines, which is really why I rang up. Um, a recent article uh, from Bloomberg, uh, which is titled Wind Turbines That Shake and Break Cost Their Maker Billions. And Siemens Energy, which is one of the more widely used turbines, is struggling to contain the fallout after discovering a main piece on the frame of its Gamesa wind turbines can move or twist over time, potentially damaging other critical components. They've uh, got a special committee looking into the high failure rate suspected to be at least 30% of their turbines 
which caused a $6 billion wipeout of Siemens Energy market value. Repairs are expected to cost at least $1.7 billion, and that doesn't include liability payments for customers' lost revenue and potential costs of design changes that could trigger years of arduous recertification processes. And this is coming on top of the fact that instead of just having a power station, you've got increased transportation costs for components for ever more wind turbines being installed. Um, I've also noticed that there's um, the wind uh, turbine manufacturers are touting low carbon steel or mild steel uh, to lower their carbon emissions. But um, high carbon steel was previously always preferred because it's harder wearing, high strength and corrosion resistant. So I wonder if that's part of the problem. If you've got frames twisting, it makes me wonder if they're actually using low carbon steel, which is mild steel. And as you know, you put carbon in to give it a tempering. But uh, at the moment, Julian, we seem to be going nowhere. Uh, uh, w- you know, we're t- <clears throat> the, the Climate Change Transformation Board talk about, you know, changes that are going to have to be made. We've got on the one side, we have... Um, Uh, we've done nothing about onshore wind we've done nothing about offshore wind we haven't investigated well they keep saying that tidal power won't work they won't seem to consider geothermal energy and yet all they say is we're going to get another interconnector but that's decades away yet so there's a lot of talk going on from various parties and and as i say i stand in the middle you know the the lay person looks around and it's almost like you're in a seaside hall of mirrors sometimes nothing seems to make sense well yeah and you know you're told one thing on the news and be told that you must be scared say all the arctic ice is melting and then at the same time you've got a russian new icebreaker that's not able to go up to the arctic sea because they got 15 foot thick sea ice in the east siberian sea which even the largest icebreaker in the world can't get through so it had to go down via the Suez, india china and round and up towards um, petra pavlov so you know what do you believe if the russians can't even get their largest icebreaker through the arctic sea and but we're being told at the same time that oh there's a climate catastrophe and the arctic sea ice is melting what do, how did those two things how can you have those two stories at the same time well I, I think the the evidence about the arctic ice caps is i mean it's generally accepted it's not a good idea if they go but as for them flooding the world it just won't happen because the arctic ice caps represent and remember it's only ice that's on the land that that really impacts it because the rest is just seaborne ice but uh, the arctic ice caps represent three percent of the ocean volume in the world there are they are literally a drop in the ocean so but just going back to what's happening on the isle of man julian the only thing that's going to happen really the only noticeable thing that's going to happen is uh, going to happen 16 weeks today 16 weeks today is thursday the 19th of october and it's when single-use plastics are going to be banned on the Isle of Man. That really is about the sum of what we've got. And from memory, if we go back a little while, we were told to have plastic bags because we didn't want to keep cutting trees down, wasn't it, to make paper bags? Yeah, and they've still not even mentioned, oh, I think it's been, uh, it's been accepted now, that the, the 5p plastic bag tax has gone nowhere on the Isle of Man. You know, charging for plastic bags really hasn't gone anywhere. It's not gone to a central fund to fund anything, to plant trees or, you know, do anything. It's just been a tax on customers just for the sake of it. So quite where we go and quite, you know, I mean, there doesn't seem to be anything that we can hang our hat on apart from, you know, the Green Living Grant and people getting 50% off a new door. I don't really see where we're going. There's no sort of bold statement from the government. It makes about as much sense as the um, 15-minute city-style thing in Oxford, where the taxi drivers that are being um, interviewed, uh, instead of driving five minutes to get somebody right next to them, which will incur them having to uh, pay a 100 quid fine or whatever, they're having to drive... um, instead of five minutes, they're having to drive half an hour all the way around the ring road around the outside of Oxford to go in from the other side. Okay. So how how is that contributing to a lowering of pollution? All right. Okay, thanks, Julian. Good to hear from you. 
Thanks, Andy. Cheers. Cheers. Now, 26 minutes past 12 on Manx Radio. And uh, Graham dropped an op in, uh, a note in. Graham is the uh, geothermal uh, advocate on the Isle of Man. So Kroger finally realised what we're up against regarding renewable energy on the Isle of Man. I've argued many times, this is Graham Fox Hume from Port Aram, uh, I've ad- argued many times the answer lies literally beneath our feet. It is geothermal energy. I urge you to look at United Downs, the Eden Project in Cornwall, where the geological situation actually parallels that on the Isle of Man. Geothermal energy is clean and green, does not produce CO2. It's unobtrusive. It's wildlife friendly. It's scalable. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year, with a lifetime in the multiple decades, if not hundreds of years. It's completely under our control. Specialized drilling companies have brought the initial cost down very significantly. So why don't our green politicians even look at this? Perhaps Kroger should look at it as a better investment, says Graham, who is a geologist and geophysicist, has a lifetime of... uh uh, experience in uh, drilling. I'm not a churchgoer, says Richie, but the basic Christian creed is that we should treat each other with love and charity as we'd wish to be treated ourselves. Is this something Tinwall might need to be reminded of occasionally by the bishop? This is the talk of, do you remember there was the talk where uh, I think it was Joni Farragher, leader of the Manx Labour Party, wanted uh, a reset to get the bishop out of Tinwall, currently on Legco, of course. Uh, the creed should also serve in the debate on assisted dying. Uh, in that stripped of dogma, it's essentially neither for nor against the practice, but it's a plea for kindness and consideration, says Richie. Uh, and a quick word about the Electoral Commission, which has uh, got a meeting tonight. It's at the Corrin Hall, Derby Road in Peel, 6.30 tonight. The Alaman Electoral Commission's been running a series of public uh, consultations across the Alaman. Their aim is to gather valuable input and perspective from the public regarding a uh, series of matters. So it's in Peel tonight on um, uh, the uh, Alaman Electoral Commission, the accessibility to voters, postal and proxy votings, the ability to vote in any polling station in a constituency, all island polling stations perhaps, candidate campaign materials, and the organisation of pre-election meetings. So, Corrin Hall, Derby Road in Peel tonight at 6.30, and uh, we've got Will with us now. Hi, uh, Wilf. Hi, Wilf. Hi, uh, hi, uh, uh, it was just, well, I'm always banging on about wasting money, and the Isle of Man does really waste millions on various schemes. Uh, take going away for jollies. Uh, like the, your manager said that now, you don't need this face-to-face thing. Well, of course you don't need it. You've got these big television. We, people look at a football match uh, with a huge tele- television um, on, in the grounds or, 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 or what's called, where, they, where they have this music thing and all that. All that sort of thing can go on. It, it don't have to be there and spend all this money on, on trips away and then uh, we stay in the best hotel, we get fed the best foods and all that crap, you see. You don't want none of that. It, it, it's just ridiculous. Um, now, another thing now, wave action. No, I don't know about wave action, but I've been on about this before. You don't need wave action. You've got the lift and the rise and the fall of the tide twice a day every day nothing stops it it's just relentless and if they can, the, the scientists can rig something up to work that way We're working by the lift and the fall of the tide we've, we've cracked it the other thing is uh, the thermal thing well on a very small scale it works for our children's school in Ramsey that's just a pipe made in the ground uh, but that's just just a school but it, it actually works you've seen you've seen you've seen films yeah. where fellows have been working in coal mines and the sweat run off them 
You see what I mean? It's just uh, there. Uh, you, now you, you, you've, got, you've got Tim Mulday, big waste of money, right now. I don't know what it costs. Is it a million? I don't know, two million? I don't know how much it costs. Well, you were saying it was going to cost a million or two million to drill this hole. Well, let's drill the hole instead. Uh, I mean, to me, um, it's it just these things they just seem ridiculous to me. Uh, Wilf, where do you stand on the gas off Mackle's head? What do you think should happen? Um, if they, most people, if they think they can do it, good luck to them. We we'll, well, let's go for it. If they can think they can do it now, I've done a lot of fishing at Mackle Head. I don't like the idea of building anything at Mackle Head, but. If it's got to be for the island, it's got to be. And I would say, go for it if they can do it. But I still prefer uh, uh, the, the lift, the lift and the drop of the tide, and also boring thermal. Okay. I mean, they do it in Iceland because uh, uh, they haven't got a they haven't got a bore so far in Iceland because it's. It's 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 erupting all the time, but um, those are those are clever people. Where when it erupts, there they make another harbour. You know they're very clever. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, Wolf. Good yeah. to hear from you. Thanks for that. Okay. Good to all hear right. from you. Thank you. And David's on now. Hi, David. Hi, Randy. Just quickly on the thing when a, a minister or a senior member of government uh, meets somebody uh, that's going to um, probably change things. All the time I was in Parliament, there was always somebody that took a minute or two people that were from the department or even the AG's department that were actually there taking notes. So I don't know why um, that particular issue is not happening. Maybe that uh, our side of the government is we haven't, we're not up to date with licences and uh, changing things over on that. But when you meet somebody, even at a lower level, you take a little note and, uh, and in some time in the future you'd exchange the notes to make sure it reflects actually what took place. Yeah, I can't decisions. understand this. You know, people might, the, the meetings may be misrepresented. I, I don't understand that. Well, all you do is say, well, I'm sorry, your view is you wanted a lamppost here, but wait a minute, it was going to be here. Now, that's fairly simple. I and mean, you build it on a bigger proportion is, is A, um, maybe we're not telling the truth we've got enough money or maybe we're saying um, we don't believe you and tell them the honest truth but if they're licensed they've got a license they just need other things to do they can move on but what I wanted to talk about and I'm changing the subject matter a little bit and nobody's talking about it and it's probably it's about the prison and the shocking report I haven't seen it but I've asked for a copy of it coming out from the prison regarding um, uh, prisoners getting, or my interpretation of it, prisoners getting released without accommodation, without a job. Well, they said uh, one, of the, um, one of the 14 um, criticisms, if you like, one of the 14 points raised was there just wasn't enough done to make sure that uh, prisoners who were being released were fit for employment, as you say, and yeah. a lot of them didn't have accommodation sorted out. Yeah. Now, the other thing is, when I was in um, Home Affairs under June Watts, and I was, uh, uh, had a little responsibility for the prison, went round the prison, uh, the new prison, like, and I went round the old one too, and that was a, an appalling state, but the new prison was fine. We've got workshops up there for a joiner's workshop with the machinery. We've got a, uh, there was a plumber's workshop that was organised. We had people coming in, had skills to teach uh, those that were on them um, that wanted to learn a skill. There was also educational programs. There was a full suite there. There's a gym, and I just wondered, you know, why aren't we? Why haven't we done that? Why is it taking so long to have a, a, an official report to come in that we're poor? When I was there, and this is the gospel, they were making panels from timber that came from the forestry board, uh, fence panels, right? They were doing a great job on them. The jig mole was set up and they were knocking them out. One of the criticisms some time ago was from the industry there, they were cheaper than anybody else could buy them for. Say, I'll use B&Q as an example on that. 
So why aren't we doing that again? There are, there are plenty of things they can actually do and occupy themselves. How important and, do you think it is, David, that prisoners who are coming out of, uh, uh, of uh, Jerby, they've paid their debts to society, how yeah. important is it that they get back in as contributing members of society? It's, it's paramount, really. And I always thought before, and, on the, and I'm not, I was never, never on the parole panel, but I used to read some of the reports. They used to say the c- conditions were, unless you had accommodation, it uh, was the biggest thing, somewhere to go to for security so you don't fall in the, down the hole straight away. And then the other one was just trying to get them a job. So where does the, uh, the, the parole people come into this? And I'd like to have some expansion on that to say we've got a prison out there and we've got so many prisoners in it and and there'll be juveniles as well there'll be some women there as well so what are we doing to get those back into society society because they've done wrong and maybe on the right road and be great citizens for the future okay all right i appreciate that david thanks for calling see you bye cheers now 23 minutes before one on man in line it's good to talk it's how we get things done So when you apply for a personal loan from Black Horse, you'll get support from one of our relationship managers who's there to talk you through your application. You could borrow up to £50,000 with up to seven years to pay it back and you could receive your money within 24 hours of approval. Ready to talk? Go to blackhorseoffshore.co.uk to request a call back today. Finance subject to status. Applicants must be 18 or over. There's a new way to Subway with two fantastic menus. Which will you go for? The all-new Subway series with 15 irresistible creations like the Big Bombay Sub, Great Goddess Salad, Emperor Wrap and Big Cheese Steak Sub Melt. Or create your own. You pick the ingredients you want and build your own sub, salad or wrap the way you want it. There's a great mix of healthy and indulgent menu items available from Subway and ShopRite, Peel and Port Erin. Drive smarter, drive more reliable, drive a great deal at Man in Motors. With a superb range of cars for every budget, always available. And if we don't have it, we'll source it. Plus, servicing, valeting and prestige detailing too. Man in Motors, Richmond Hill, Douglas. Find us on Facebook or call 420 420. That's 420 420. Drive a better bargain at Man in Motors. Singers, dancers, musicians, performers. Put your hands together for the Young Stars of Man. Thursday, 27th July at the Villa Gaiety. A live variety show showcasing the incredible talent of our island. Presented by and raising funds for I'll Listen, the Young Person's Mental Health Charity. Tickets available now at villagaiety.com or on 600 5. The Young Stars of Man, supported by Simcox. Sport has a new home on social media for Manx Radio, where you can keep up to date with all the latest sporting action on the Isle of Man. Our new dedicated Manx Radio Sports Facebook page is now live, bringing you all the latest sports news and features. So whether it's motorsport, <laughs> FC Isle of Man, Manx football, rugby, hockey and much more besides. Make sure to like and follow Manx Radio Sport on Facebook for all the latest updates. On air and online, this is your home for sport on Ireland. The nation station, Manx Radio. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. 21 minutes before one. Diane's on now. Hi, Diane. Oh, hello, Andy. Hope you're keeping well. Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm ringing in about motor cars. Um... This is a video that's on the internet by Neil McCoy Ward, who is now living on the island. I've been following Neil for about four years at least, when he was living in London and doing all the shop closures, etc. So he's well known. Um, the, it's most private ownerships of cars to be phased out by 2030 and the target is a 95 reduction target and so it's about and there's more on this video that I'm mentioning um, you, you what is more or less saying on, on one of them is that you, there might be one car that can be owned by four people right. that you can share 
rock or whatever. But the main thing is that they are planning by 2030 to have reduced the uh, the ownership of cars by 95%. And this 2030, it's also planned, which is a little bit different subject, is the, uh, the ending of red meat and dairy products. So this is all tied in with the World Economic Forum, as are these 15-minute cities and neighborhoods and this one in Douglas. I mean, in Douglas, it, I, as I understand it, there's 133 properties, but only parking for 89 but for bicycles, I think it was about 241 places. So, like, when people went to that meeting, they were not asking the right questions because they probably didn't know about this. But this will be devastating. And it also includes EVs. It's a total reduction. It's all to meet this climate change, which most things are about. So I thought I'd pass it on. It's, I can't send it out because I can't get into my internet. Uh, my um, emails now I haven't been able to get in there for about two or three weeks. You're, you're not making millions of pounds off Neil McCoy Ward, are you, uh, on one of his uh, financial courses or anything? No, no, I haven't. I was hoping to sign up to him, you know, like with emails and that. But uh, you can't find the space. But he's on the Internet. He's on YouTube. Anybody can put it in. And it's called Most Private Car Ownership to be phased out by 2030. And it's well worth watching. So okay. I'm passing that on to you, um, Andy, All and right. to everybody listening, because this is where it's going. OK, we appreciate okay. that. Good to hear from you, Diane. Thanks for yeah. that. Yeah, bye. OK, yes, Neil McCoy Ward, if you uh, follow him, he's all over YouTube and he's uh, an investor and economic forecaster and has uh, a way, apparently, that you can make a lot of money. But anyway, that's up to you. I'm not recommending him. I'm just uh, passing on that information that Diane said. Neil McCoy Ward. Uh, and Peter's with us now. Hi, Peter. Good afternoon, Andy. Uh I was reading the examiner yesterday, and I haven't got it in front of me, so it's all from memory, but the headline was about the nurses' strike action. Yes. And according, according to the newspaper, um, they had a turnout of 46% of the membership, of which, of those 46%, 80% voted for strike action. Uh, to my mind, that means 36% of the membership voted for strike action. Now, in the UK, and I know we're not in the UK, but as a guideline, unless um, trade union legislation says, unless you get 50% of the votes, it doesn't matter what the vote is, it's ignored. Now, to my mind, 30% voting for strike is, does not give the trade union a mandate to call a strike. Um, so what do you think should happen? What do you, I mean, do you think the nurses um, have got a case, Peter? Well, it depends on your point of view. Everybody's got a case, haven't they? Um, they certainly work hard. Um, everybody complains about the hospital. It's a bit like complaining about the police until you need them, and then all of a sudden they're fantastic. Um, I think that... It's like most militants, they, they have a vote, and the ones who are not militants, who are perhaps not happy with the situation, but don't want to strike, they don't say anything. And it's only the militants that get here. I fully support any worker having the right to strike, if, withhold the labor, if, if that's what they want to do. But a union, um, to my mind, has got to have at least fifty percent of the of the vote to make it, not thirty six percent. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, Peter. Good to hear from you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. For that uh, and Brian uh, joins us now on Man in Line. Hi, Brian. How are you today? I'm pretty good. It's a lovely day. That's the important thing. It's a thing. lovely day. I was just listening to David there. He was 
keep asking the, the questions. Why have they not done this? Why have they not done that in the prison? Why don't they do this? Well, I have a few questions for myself, David. David, why don't you get the moss off the footpaths all up round Springfield Court? Why don't you get the hedges cut up round Springfield Court? Elderly people there are struggling. Talking about hedges, why don't you get all these hedges cut back so we can use our footpaths, particularly at the bottom of Royal Avenue, where the corner of Royal Drive and... um, what's it called, the bus route there, there's a blind corner that pedestrians have to walk in the road facing the oncoming traffic because somebody's let their hedge grow right out. We're only yards away from somebody tragically lost their life. And so, but that's, over. that's a private hedge, is it? Somebody's it's on... a private hedge, yeah. but they have the powers. I mean, hedges are impeding footpaths all over the district. And David's quirk is concentrating his efforts on the prison and all sorts of other things, and we haven't even got the commissioner's clock working on the front of the Manx Arms yet. Well, I have to say, I mean, David isn't the entire Uncan commissioner. He is a commissioner, and he was phoning in a private uh, in a private capacity. But, yeah, go on. Yeah, well, and, and in a private capacity, he, he was potentially jeopardising a court case, which ended up in the commissioners spending our money trying to resolve an issue that should have been resolved in the boardroom. I think it's a disgrace that the authority has degraded to the point where it is, where we've got this infighting and stupidity. I'd never believe that one of the premier authorities on the island would stoop as low as it is and let the whole of the district down. I'm really disappointed in everything in the world at the moment, but it comes right back to my own doorstep. King Edward Park, there's bushes I've complained about taking up almost 70% of the footpath for the last five, six years. And I've sent photographs to your good self about the footpath. Oh, I've seen them, yes. Yeah, I mean, these properties are single-bedroomed for elderly people, and they're trying to get in and out their door on a skating rink. Well, I, I just find that absolutely ridiculous. Maybe it's the time that we go, we take up a pair of shears ourselves, uh, Brian, and to hell with the consequences. Well, you know, I'm very, very tempted. As you probably know, I have a farm. I have a nice big tractor. I have a nice big hedge trimmer. I could knock some of those hedges back to a sticks in seconds. But there'd be an outcry, be it for the birds or whatever. But we are talking about two hedges that are only yards away from where somebody lost their life. Come on, we've got to be a bit realistic here. There's got to be some civic pride about this district. Uh, Okay, Uh, It's good to hear from you. Uh, Thanks for being with us, Brian. Okay, thanks. Cheers Cheers. now. 11 minutes to one. And Peter's with us now. Hi, Peter. Oh, hello, Andy. Um, It's Peter Mercott here. I've been ringing in, as you know, uh, for some time about the assisted dying bill. It's now published... There's uh, three points. It's a very complex bill, and it's one that we really need a full discussion on Max Radio, such as uh, I took part in in with um, uh, with Mr. Gorn, you know, Phil Gorn. Yes. And we need another one because the bill's complex. I'm only going to make three points here. Point number one, there was a consultation... And the consultation proved that the majority of people were against this bill, so why is it being introduced? That seems to be a similar thing to we had a consultation, if you remember, about Sunday racing during the TT. The majority were against it, and yet it went ahead. That is something which I think cries out for an answer. The second thing is... As you will know, one of the points that I've made all the way through this, that the bill is not really expressed in the clearest terms that it ought to be expressed. It should be called the Assisted Suicide Brackets Amendment Bill. Now, people have said, oh, no, 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 it's nothing to do with assisted suicide, assisted dying. Well, 
the truth is out because in the in section 10 criminal liability it says this and here's a piece of legislation that i've mentioned on the radio all along in the criminal law act 1981 after section 2 brackets abetment of suicide insert and then what you've got to insert is that um Section 2 does not apply to any person in respect of the provision of assistance to another person in accordance with the Assisted Dying Act. Now, translated into the English, what's that, what that is saying is that if A assists the suicide of B in accordance with the Assisted Dying Act, if it got unfortunately ever passed into law, that would not leave A liable for a prosecution under the Criminal Law Act, but it would nevertheless be uh, an assisted suicide, but it would be one that the law would uh, allow. That's the simple point. I've made that point all along, and uh, the point that I've made has been wholly proved by what the bill says, and I knew it would. So I would urge everyone, look at Section 10, and uh, and that amounts to... Um, confirming what I've been saying. But there's another very puzzling, well, it was puzzling at first until I read the bill even more closely. And this is the bit where we need a fuller discussion. It says this uh, in section 10, no punishment or forfeiture shall be incurred by any person who shall kill, note the word, another person in the provision of assistance to that person in accordance with the Assisted Dying Act 2023. Now, quite frankly, you've got a curious use of language here because if A kills B, you wouldn't normally say he's assisted his di- he's assisting his dying. If someone points a gun at me and says he wouldn't say I'm going to assist you to die, he would say I'm going to kill you. And so the question arises is why have we got this word kill in a bill which is about assisted suicide and the answer is because it strays in one part that I can't go into now because time wouldn't allow me it strays into euthanasia now uh, because it makes it quite clear in one part that the person who's asking for the assistance decides must decide whether they are going to take the necessary means of uh, killing themselves i.e. committing suicide, or whether uh, a medical professional is going to do it for them. Mm. In other words, he kills them. When leave was given to introduce, because they used the word assisted dying, I think it was well understood from that uh, terminology that this did not include euthanasia. And indeed, in the overview of the consultation, euthanasia was actually put as a separate thing from assisted dying that that wasn't my wording that was the wording of the mover of the bill well the way it was done so we'll see i mean mean, why are we straying into that uh, well, time will tell at the moment, and obviously there's a, a long way to go where this is concerned. And Peter, I appreciate you um, uh, clarifying that point for us today. Thanks for being with us. OK, thank you. Bye-bye. Six minutes before one on Max Radio. Uh, that's the, uh, Peter's referring to the um, assisted dying bill that uh, went through its first reading and will move on later on this year. We wait and we see what happens. Senors and senoritas, welcome to the Costa del Douglas for a first ever beach day. Slip into your flip-flops, grab your bucket and spade and come join the fun at Queen's Promenade Beach and Walkway Saturday, July the 1st with a full day of attractions for all ages. Free bouncy castle, children's beach games, kite building, beach fitness and yoga, sandcastle competitions, stalls, rock pooling, the opening of the new bathing platform and beach huts, plus much more. Check Facebook for all the details and updates. The first ever Douglas Beach Day, July 1st, presented by Douglas City Council and supported by your nation station, Manx Radio. Cancer Research UK's Relay for Life is back. Don't miss your chance to honour everyone who's been affected by cancer and the progress made in research. 
Unite with family and friends, set your team fundraising goal and join a celebration of community fundraising. Search Relay for Life Isle of Man and enter for free today. The Relay for Life, 26th August at the National Sports Centre. Your chance to help beat cancer. I've just called the Guernsey Bank, skipped an international about our savings. And did you get a helpful robot? <laughs> no, at skipped an international, you speak to a very helpful real person. That's refreshing these days. Well, that's why I chose them, for the perfect combination of personal customer service and some of the best savings rates. All by calling 01481 730 730 or visit skiptoninternational.com. Skipton International is licensed to take deposits by the Guernsey Financial Services Commission and is a participant in the Guernsey Banking Deposit Compensation Scheme. Details at dcs.gg. Terms and conditions apply. Don't miss some red-hot bargains in the Tinwald Mills Summer Sale with up to a blistering 50% off store-wide. Open daily, 10 till 5.30. This is the Isle of Man talking. The Man in Line. Tomorrow, Charles Gard's going to be our Man in Line. The uh, heritage campaigner, filmmaker, has made many, many wonderful films about the Isle of Man. Do you remember all the Happy Holidays series with Terry Kringle? Looking at how things used to be, he's done Curiosities of the Isle of Man, Isle of Man from the Air. Uh, tomorrow, I- I'll tell you now, it's a show Charles doesn't want to do. Charles would much prefer not to be talking about how some things on the Isle of Man don't look very nice. But all that aside, we'll be talking about heritage on the Isle of Man, what can possibly happen in the future, and who we think is going to do it. Text, email, call and WhatsApp tomorrow. Uh, A note in from Ian uh, says, Andy, I know you can't educate somebody who's going to throw rubbish out of a car window like food cartons, but this morning, while cutting the grass outside the house... I found a number of tear-off strips from the TT. I've cleared some in the past few weeks. I don't know what we do about those. Uh, Thanks to Ben and Chris and Howie on the show today. Back tomorrow with Charles Gard. W-I-N-T.